the chapter, that chapter gives us some really a, a unique perspective on how God sees the world. And I wanted you to be able to see that because it gives you keys to be able to overcome this world. We're coming to the holiest week of the year for Christianity, and that's why we call it Holy Week. And it's the time when we celebrate the, the uh, death and resurrection of our Savior. And if it wasn't for his death, we would not even understand or even be able to enter into salvation. And if it wasn't for his resurrection, we'd have no redemption at all. And it's that redemption that gives us the ability to live and move and have our being in him today. So let me take you on a short journey. I won't go through the whole chapter with it. I will, I will summarize it now. So that we could see how God sees the world. So that we could see what God sees and overcome the world. Because we're coming to a time in our life in the next few weeks where we're being asked to believe something that just like Mary and Martha were asked to believe. Jesus says to them that I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he die, yet shall he live. Now, I thought that was the beginning of it. And, they, and, and what she says to her, him is, is that uh, we know, we've been taught that you are the resurrection. And he will rise again someday. But what did Jesus say to her? I am the resurrection and the life. So it's not something that happens afar off. It's something that you can experience today in your life. <clears throat> So he's talking to his disciples and he says to them, and he says to them that he's asleep. And they're saying to him, well, you know, it's really not an ordinary sleep. He's actually dead. Okay, guys? <laughs> I mean, do we get it? The guy's dead. And of course, Mary and Martha are talking about the fact that he is so dead that he stinks. So he is moaning and groaning because, number one, they are living on just the words that they were taught and have not experienced it. Do you hear that? He moans and he groans inside saying, oh, how am I going to be able to get them to see what I see? Because God doesn't see you dead. He sees you alive already when you're in Christ. In another part of the scripture, we see that they ask him the question, why are you going back to Bethany? Aren't you, they're going to, might stone you to death, right? So you see another place where he said, where, where the facts are coming up. And these facts are, are telling him, okay, that you probably shouldn't go there that you probably, that no one's going to understand what's happening. The disciples believe that he's dead. They're not sure what sleep means and what death means. That Mary and Martha are stuck in their religion because they think that that's what they were taught, so they're going to just repeat that. Are we following so far? I'm trying to build a case for you so that you can understand why we see things the way we do. He gets to the tomb, and of course, they go, Jesus, he's been there four days. And uh, I hate to tell you, but he stinks. Pretty bad. Now, personally, I think I would probably do the exact same thing. In fact, I probably wouldn't even go, because <laughs> I, don't, I don't like to see that stuff. <laughs> in our lives, we come to places in our life where we find ourselves at these crossroads, where we are being told how things are and not how God sees them. And because we believe how things are, we can't see beyond how God sees them. 
It's important to understand because this is the story of our entire lives. Since we've been little, by the time we, I mean, when you're really little, you I mean, you think of something and you live in a whole other world, don't you? I mean, you're out there, I know as little kids, I remember out there in the sandbox playing with my Tonka truck, right? I didn't have a care in the world, but by the time you got to about, you know, old enough to understand, they were starting to say, okay, now you've got to become a responsible human being. And you've got to understand the facts of life, right? Nothing wrong with that because that's how you interact with this world, Correct? But the kingdom of God seems to be different than that in some way. Because the kingdom of God says that I have a heavenly Jerusalem when all I can see is a physical Jerusalem. The kingdom of God says that Lazarus lives even though he not only is dead, but he smells. Our religion teaches us all the books of the Bible and teaches us them well. And many of us have learned Scripture because of them, but few of us have ever experienced them. Deep down inside to understand it, and so we interpret Scripture based on what we can see, what we can feel, what we can touch, based on our external senses. And because of that, we interpret Scripture in a way that leads us to understand it as a physical object, when it's really what is physical is a reflection of what's spiritual, not what's spiritual. Are you following me? We have to learn to see beyond the grave in our life. And so when we learn how to see what God sees, look at Ezekiel. Listen to what it says. Thus says the Lord God. It's short, by the way. O my people, I will open your graves and I will have you rise from them. Just prior to that, God is talking to Ezekiel and he's looking at the dry bones. And he's asking Ezekiel the question, Can these dry bones live again? I don't know, Lord. (laughs) Only you know. And then we hear the commandment, O my people, I will open your graves and have you rise from them and bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. You see, here is the exact same thing that Christ is doing at the tomb of Lazarus where we begin to understand in our life that even though we see things in a way that make no sense to our early worldly senses, God is showing us that he is able to overcome all of them. That nothing is impossible. Well, that's for Jesus, but not for me, because, you know, all I can see is death all around me. All I can see is problems all around me. All I can see is is that the stones of doubt and fear are being thrown at me every single day of my life. I don't hear God speak to me like Ezekiel is hearing him. Do you? If you do, we we need to talk. (laughs) Jesus does a unique thing. Because what is faith? Faith is confidence, isn't it? And so when you walk in faith, you're walking in confidence, knowing that God has already heard you. And so amidst all the things in our life that cause us to only see the facts of life, God says that he is able to be above that. I remember it was this last week, two weeks ago, that our brother Paul reminded me about David, that he was the eighth son. And being the eighth son, he, that means that he was going to be someone that learned to live above nature. Because that's what eight means. That's why you have 
the number eight for those who were in the ark because they were living above the judgment. All around you is judgment and death, doubt and fear. The stones of life are constantly hitting us. And if you think you get rest from them for a moment, they come pretty quickly by the time you walk out the front door of your house. Even if you're feeling great and spiritual, right? All of a sudden, well, okay, that's spiritual. Now you got to go to work, <laughs> right? <laughs> now you got to face the problems of life. Now you got these things that are going on. And every single one of them, those stones that attack you go to what? The only reason they affect us is because they affect us is that they go to the concept of self. Everyone that hits you goes to the concept of self. Didn't Jesus say, the devil has nothing on me? And the reason why he said that is because no matter what the devil threw at him, he could not affect his concept of self because he was the Son and is the Son of God. And what is he training you and I to be? The sons and daughters of the living God. That's what this world is about. And so in order to complete our training, God wants us to learn how to walk in the Spirit. And to walk in the Spirit means that you're going to walk through. Remember when Jesus was at the temple and he says, this is the year of favor, and he escapes out, and they're ready to stone him. And what does it say? He went through the crowd. They want to throw him off a cliff. He escaped all the stones. The stones represent the facts of life. And that's what we want to do with what God is saying to us. We want to only believe the facts, what we see physically with our eyes, what we hear. In fact, we're masters at what we hear. In fact, what we hear affects us so much, it affects every decision that we make because what we hear affects our belief. That's why when you learn to hear what God hears, he says faith comes by hearing. By hearing what? The word of God. Guess what? Your fears and your doubt come by hearing, by hearing the words of the world. Because what happens? When you believe something, you feel it. You cannot have a belief in your life unless you feel it. And when you feel it, you begin to do it in your life, not even knowing you're doing it. And so now Jesus comes to this preface of this place where there's death facing him. And now he's got an entire crowd around him. The crowd is looking at him. And he says, remove the stone. Remove the stone. What is the stone? It's your doubts and your fears. Remove them. And they remove the stone. And I can imagine... The, his poor sisters, Lazarus' sisters are going, what is he doing? You can't, this is not good. They remove the stone. And listen to what he says. <clears throat> Jesus perturbed again. What was he perturbed? What's the most pleasing thing to God? Faith. Isn't that what the word says? You can't even please God without faith perturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay across it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister said, Lord, by now he'd be a stench. I wonder where, where they were from. That's not like from the South. <laughs> be a stench. <laughs> he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe did I not tell you if you believe? Hasn't the scripture brought us to this place in our lives constantly? If you believe, then it is yours. You will see the glory of God. How many in this room want to see the glory of God? I do. So Jesus said, 
Take away the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you hear me. Would you say that that was a prayer of confidence? And not only did he say, I thank you that you hear me this one time, he says, I thank you that you always hear me. But because of the crowd, I have said this. So what is Jesus trying to do? He's trying to show us how to pray. He wants you to see it, feel He wants you to feel it. That they may do what? Believe that you sent me. What did Jesus say about that, about himself? He says, the Father sent him, right? The Father and I are one, but the Father is greater than I. You have been sent as well, my brothers and sisters. There is no reason in the world why your prayers are not heard. You can have the confidence because Jesus is trying to show you how to live in faith, in confidence, knowing that you have been sent by God to this schoolroom, the world, to learn how to become what? Overcomers and to live by faith. You were sent here by grace. But he's teaching you in this schoolroom to live by faith. And so our whole lives have these moments in it, almost daily, like it's a test. Will we trust God? Will we believe? Will we feel it? Or will we be like Mary and Martha when they said, well, we were taught in Sunday school that that's how it's going to be. No, do you believe because you know it's real? In you, have you experienced it? That's what he wants. Believe me, I can guarantee you that these people that were in front of this grave watching what Jesus was doing and Mary and Martha, they were feeling it. Because what happens if he doesn't rise from the dead? Faith is being tested at this point. And when he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. You know how we cry? Jesus, if you will, please, I beg you. He's looking for men and women that live in the confidence of knowing that God lives in you. Do you not know, as Paul says to the Corinthians, that Jesus lives in you? It's not you that do it. It is not Jesus to do it. He is showing us that it's the Father that is doing these things through him. And he says, so as I have sent, as God has sent, my Father has sent me into the world, so what do I do with you? I send you into the world. In fact, Jesus made a promise to us when he said that not only will you do the same works that I do, but you will do even greater. So what is he teaching us to do? He's teaching us to increase the confidence in our heart so that when we see the stone in front of the grave in our lives, when we see and hear the stones from the outside and the hearing of the ear and the doubts and the fears that are coming our way, we can keep with laser focus on knowing what God wants in our life. That nothing will ever, ever be able to destroy what God has done. That he will marry within you that grace and faith will come together and you will be able to move and have your being in him. And so the reason why he cries out with a loud voice is because he's speaking with confidence, knowing that it's already a done deal. Or will we live out Easter week? Because it's nice. Because it's our culture. Because it's our religion, I submit to you today, live in the power of the resurrection. 
Don't allow the dead works of religion. Don't allow the dead works of this world. Don't allow the doubts and the fears and the voices that are coming your way, usually from the outside, telling you what you should believe when you should be doing what it says in here. You should be experiencing what God already knows. Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to him, untie him and let him go. Freedom! No longer is death holding you down. You have life. And so when you go out into the world, guess what? I'm going to tell you, I know it's going to sound odd. It would come from me being a little bit odd. When I was a little kid, I used to have a reoccurring dream. It was the scariest thing. You, I would wake up sweating as a little kid. And I, realized, I told Arlene, I said, I think for the first time in my life, I realized what the dream meant. And I dreamed in my dream that I was buried alive. And I would wake up doing this in the dream, pounding the top of the tomb, of the, of the coffin. It's the scariest thing you could imagine. And my whole life, I've lived with this dream. And this week alone, I came to the realization that is my whole life. And that maybe, just maybe, I'm starting to wake up. And that Christ I was dead. I was buried. And I was put into a tomb. But now I'm alive. And I'm no longer dead. But I have life within me. Ezekiel, when he looks at the dry bones, can they live again? Yes. What did he have to do? Speak to the bones. It's funny that the bones is the same cognate word for a tree. Eretz. It means to have substantial foundation. Let me ask you, do you have a substantial foundation that this skin is hanging on? Has it come alive again? Are you living in confidence or are you living in death? And you don't have to walk around being pompous. You have to know where inside of yourself that you are a child, a child of God. And that God is with you. Do you not know? Have you passed the test that Christ lives in you? That's a miracle. You don't have to live in death anymore. I don't have to live with that reoccurring dream anymore. Because why? I'm alive. You're alive. That's exciting. That's what Easter is all about. I remember when I was a little kid, I mentioned it to you last week, and I'm going to say it again. I remember driving in the great uh, barrens, what do they call those? The Pine Barrens of New Jersey. I was maybe six or seven years old at the most. And I remember it was a Volkswagen, those hatchbacks, you know, the old ones from the 60s. And I remember leaning forward and I go, Mom, Dad, today's Easter. Jesus rises from the dead today. <laughs> Mind you, you know my parents, most of you. <laughs> They're not religious. <laughs> they go, okay, Kyle. <laughs> Sit back down. I don't think they had seatbelts in the cars back then. <laughs> Today, Jesus rises again. Can you have that kind of faith in your life that he rises up in you? Or are you going to leave this church today Look at the facts of life. See the stone over the tomb and say, well, I guess it's not for me, but everybody else. No. How do you get there? It says, believe. I do this so that they might do what? Believe. And what does it mean? Have you ever believed something with your whole heart and didn't feel it? No. I don't think so. You believe something like maybe in your brain, but to feel it means you know it. You have confidence in it. 
That means you feel it. And so when you believe that God is in your life and that there's nothing impossible for him and the stones of life that are all around you that are telling you it's impossible, when you know and you believe in confidence, even though there's stones in the way, God has the ability to change it. What does it take? What is faith? It's persistent belief in that which is unseen. Go look it up. Persistent belief. That is what faith is. That's the action of faith. So that means, what are you going to do? You're going to learn to believe God, and you're going to feel it. Not just believe it because it's supposed to be believed, but because you know it inside. There's nothing impossible. God is able to do everything in your life. He's able to change everything in your life. And do you know that he not only can change your future, but he can reshape your past. Nothing is impossible for him. So live today. And you will see this place grow. You will see that the desert will bloom. You will see that the rivers that come from the, from the walls of Jerusalem will reignite the desert. He will take which is the own, which means a barren place, and he will make it bloom. And so if you're feeling in your life that desert, if you're feeling in your life that the depth of the stones that are being hit you in your life by the words of others, you and I keep our eyes on the power of the resurrection of Christ because without it, you are just a clanging symbol and your religion means nothing. That's exciting. That's what I wake up for every day, knowing, exercising that faith. Faith is like a muscle. You have to go to the gym. Now, I don't do that well. (laughs) And he says that all you have to do is have the faith of a mustard seed. I don't know. Is it the smallest seed in the seed kingdom? I don't know. But all I know is it's pretty darn small. So it doesn't take much. And God is so anxious to prove himself to you, to show you his love, that he'll take it and he'll do something with it. And may the Lord add a blessing to his word. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, as we prepare, Lord, for the great power of the resurrection in each one of our lives. Help us to see beyond the stones, O Lord God, that are rolled in front of the graves of our lives. Help us to see, O Lord God, that we were dead, but now we are alive only because of what you did for us on the cross. We bless you and honor you. Speak into our lives. We ask this in your precious name. Amen and amen.